I am Vinny Todorich. Folks, your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed. This woman has been on the show before several times. And if I have my druthers, and I still don't know what a druther is, but if I had one, I would have this woman on every Friday because she's doing something that no one else is doing out there. She She's get, taking these salacious headlines that we see almost weekly, not, not, no, not weekly, daily. <laughs> We're now seeing these headlines daily. And she'll take them, she'll find one, she'll, I'm saying cherry pick, that might not be the right word, but she'll take one and go look into it because she's got the smarts to do so. And then she will put out the information on her blog and uh, tell you the truth. Uh, Folks, I'm talking about none other than Dr. Zoe Arcom. How you doing, Zoe? Very nice intro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but that's about the truth of it, right, Zoe? I mean, every week, you know, every morning, I kind of cringe and then I hit my Twitter button because I don't look at regular Twitter. I just go through and read what people are asking me. And sometimes they go, hey, what about this? They, they now say that this is going to kill you. That's going to cause a heart attack. Or, you know, your your liver's going to fall out through your anus if you eat A, B, C, and D. And I'll go, what? And then I'll click on it, and it's like, here we go. Another headline yeah. coming out of places like Harvard sometimes, mm-hmm. which is scary enough, right? Yeah, every day. I'm, I'm up to almost episode 700 of doing a Monday note. So every Monday, maybe not Christmas Day if it falls on a Monday, I take a study and I get them sent to me all the time and I have to get just get back to people with a holding note saying, great, thanks ever so much. It's going on the possibles list. Um, I'm getting several studies a day and I do one a week. So I try to pick, I mean, some just, just, just create themselves. So I remember we talked about the red meat and diabetes back in the autumn last year. So bad, um, so counterintuitive coming out from the Harvard epidemiological paper production factory. You just have to address it. You know that you just throw all the other ones to one side. Even if you had one in good shape for next Monday, you stop working on it and you make sure you get this one countered as soon as possible. And I guess the one that we're going to start talking about today was, was very similar. Um, this sort of intermittent fasting headline barrage nonsense that came out just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and looking behind that, it was another piece of nonsense like red meat and diabetes. Yeah, so let's let's just go right into it. So it the headline literally said, if I'm remembering right, and correct me if I'm wrong, intermittent fasting increases the risk of cardiac, wait for it, folks, death. Not yes. disease. Yeah. In yeah, other words, if you, if you intermittent fast, or it's it's purporting to say that you're going to drop dead. Yeah. From cardiac arrest, I guess. I mean. Yeah. So when you see that headline, you go, "Okay, hang on." <laughs> I mean, the, the the when I saw that without reading anything, I just wrote a, a quick quip back on Twitter, and I said. Yeah, maybe overeating is the way we should be doing everything. Yeah, right? yeah. Because it's the opposite. If And by the way, that's not how science is done, folks. I was just being an ass. If one thing causes a problem can cause immediate death, because that's what they're saying, not cardiac disease, they're saying death, then the opposite would have to be true. Correct? Maybe. Um, but not. I, I need a specific example. The logic doesn't always hold that if not X, then yeah, right. that we're going into bar- binary maths there, actually. <laughs> that might be a dodgy one for a Friday afternoon. <laughs> but by the way, isn't that what we do in, you know, in social media and not science? It's like, well, if this is not true, the yeah. exact opposite must be true. Yeah, yeah. And no one ever looks, we do it in politics, we do it in religion, we do it yeah. with food, we do it with everything. If this is not the answer, the exact opposite must be the answer. Yeah, yeah. And And sometimes that's true. Yeah, if it's not day, then it is night. But it's not always the case that if you don't do this, then this will happen. So um, 
I, I'm just very aware of my sort of set theory head going on here at the moment. There, there will be exceptions. Yeah. Okay. But we, we can plow into this one because, um, because this one was, was BS. So Do you wanna... let's, yeah, let, let's just go right in. I, I, okay. I so your answers on this. Right. So let, let me explain what we were looking at here. So there was a, a conference in Chicago arranged by the American Heart Association, and they have a number of sponsors who um, are particularly involved in fake food. So they won't want people to not be eating a lot during the day. So you're starting off with a bit of a conflict of interest background. I'm not say saying that the researchers on this particular paper were conflicted, but the conference itself was conflicted. It was a conference presentation. So I don't normally dissect conference presentations because we don't normally get enough information. I normally wait until there's a peer reviewed paper in the New England Medical Journal or whatever, JAMA, Lancet, BMJ, and then look at that paper. So I didn't have a paper to go on, but there was a pretty detailed press release, um, which came through Reuters in the normal sort of press release um, or AP associated. Um, and then there was a poster because quite often when something is presented a, at a conference, they have what's called a poster presentation. And a poster presentation is actually quite a useful, it's normally actually up on the wall in the conference as an A3, it is a literal poster. But what they do is they summarize all of their research onto this poster. And this just happened to be a particularly good poster. So it had a lot of information on it. So I was able to get who were the participants? When did they do this um, dietary questionnaire? What exactly was the dietary questionnaire? How many people were involved? What groups did they put them in? So I could get a lot of information and it was more, more than enough to tear it apart. So um, I guess the first thing to say about the um, the research is it involved 20,000 people and they put them into eating window groups in what I would call an uneven way. So there were five eating windows that they defined. One was if you ate for fewer than eight hours a day, which is the group that they ended up calling the intermittent fasting group. That's not intermittent fasting as we know it. And we'll come back to who those people were. So it was below eight hours a day, or if you ate in a window of eight to 10 hours or 10 to 12 hours, then they had a particularly big group, which was 12 to 16 hours. And then it was anyone who was eating for more than 16 hours a day. And you think, well, when are they actually sleeping if they're <laughs> eating for more than 16 hours a day? So first of all, they've got uneven groups. They didn't do, you know, two hour intervals you form uniformly. And they also then didn't allocate the people uniformly. So if you're analyzing 20,000 people and you're putting in, them into five groups, the fairest way to do it is in what we call quintiles, which is the bottom fifth then the next fifth and so on. And then you've got even groups of people. Um, now what they did they created these uneven groups and then they just put people in, oh, you guys said you ate for fewer than eight hours a day. They ended up being 2% of the entire population that was studied. So 20,000 people, they ended up being about 400 people. And then they chose whoa, whoa, not- whoa. Hang on, yeah, hang yeah, on. Yeah. I, I, I have to jump in here because yeah. I didn't realize it was gonna be that wonk. I thought yeah. it was gonna be, you know, 4,000, you know, if you're going to put them in quintiles and yeah, maybe, yeah. You know, maybe 2,000 versus the 4,000 that should have been in the group. Totally. Okay, 400, that's like 10% of what I thought the number was going to be. Yeah, which is 2% of all the people in the study. So right. you're starting off, the, the entire headlines are starting off based on the group that accounts for 2% of all the people in the study. It gets even worse when we when we get on to deaths it gets even worse. We need to just, we'll come back to that because this is really important, the uneven yeah, group sizes. I thumbnail on that because people listen yeah. on subways and on buses and in cars and they, they you know, our voices just kind of wash over when we listen. I, I just wanted to put a thumbnail into that thought because yeah. that's crazy already. Yeah, and, we, and we, we need to come back to that. I just need okay. to now go to what actually counted as eating for fewer than eight hours a day. So they're not talking about people who do intermittent fasting today. These questionnaires, these food frequency questionnaires were done. There were two done in this particular study. One was done between 2003 and 2004, and the other one was done between 2005 and 2006. So we say that 20,000 people that are from a particular study that make them quite representative of US people, what kind of person back in 2003, 4, 5, was saying, I only eat 
within a sort of eight hour window. So somebody gets up, starts smoking, maybe a bit hungover from the night before, doesn't fancy breakfast, drinking black coffee all morning, has a really, really bad brunch McDonald's intake around 12 o'clock, working, drinking, smoking, gets home, maybe has dinner seven o'clock. You're, you're in an eight hour window there and then spends the rest of the evening drinking, smoking, coffee, alcohol, whatever. That That is a, that's somebody they're now calling an intermittent faster. That's not you or Sean Baker or me. I tend not to eat overnight for about 12 or 13. Hours. That's not us. Yeah. This is. Yeah. Uh, they're not putting on yoga pants and heading out to bar no. class. No. And then when you look at the characteristics table, and thankfully this poster had the characteristics table, which is, okay, they're in these five groups of those five very uneven windows. What did the person look like in that sort of below eight hours window? They were fantastically more likely to be black. They were fantastically more likely to be smokers and to have some pre-existing condi conditions. Now, the researcher said, oh, yeah, yeah, we adjusted for that. You can never adjust for a whole person. You can right. never adjust. I mean, could they just not afford to eat that much? If, if you're talking about some um, some person, predominantly male, predominantly black, predominantly smoking, um, is, is that a, a different, a whole different profile? Is that a person who just doesn't have the money to be having three meals a day? Um, right. Is that somebody working on Wall Street who's just it's snorting cocaine? Well, they don't put drug right. abuse in the characteristics table. Well, you know, who is that person? It's, it's not the same as, as the other person. Now, what they then typically do when they put people into these five groups, and they should have done it evenly, what they then always do, and I've never seen what they did in this study, they always take the reference group as either the bottom group or the top group. And it's usually the bottom group. So they say, right, this is the group that's um, not eating um, many whole grains, let's say, and we're going to make those the ref reference group. So they're 1.0. And then we're going to compare the top group to those guys. And then we're going to come up with a conclusion that says, oh, they, they've either got 0.8% of the risk of the bottom group or 1.2% of the risk. So you're either saying that compared to that bottom group, the top group has got lower risk or higher group. Well, in this study, they made group four the reference group. Okay. So in those groups that I said, fewer than eight hours, eight to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 16, that unusual big group, and then beyond 16 hours, they made the 12 to 16 group the reference group. 60% of the people in the study were in that reference group. So you've taken most people, and then you're trying to damn the people that fall into this very unusual below eight hours which ends up only being 2% of people anyway. Right. And then, of course, it gets even worse because if you've only got 2% of the entire study population in that group, when it comes to deaths, you're off the scale. So the big find, and a lot of people looked at this study, and, and you know, I could reel off some names, but I won't. None of them got this big find because they don't look at the numbers. 31 deaths is what those headlines were based on. So among those 400 people, there were only 31 people who then went on to die from cardiovascular disease. So your entire headlines around the world were based on 0.15% of the people in this study because they had to both have said, oh, I only eat within an eight hour window, which was bugger all people in the first place, and then to have died, which was even smaller part of bugger all. I mean, you're into not what you're into 31 people that produce this headline. How, how is that research? It's not. And just to let the audience know, if you take that group, the, the one second from the top with the 6,000 people, several hundred of those people would have to die to even get close to equaling the number of the 400 people at the bottom. Am absolutely. I doing I'm doing that math in my head, but yeah, that's, that's absolutely. pretty close. Yeah. And that would be unusual, right? Yeah. For that yeah. many people to die. And and we don't even know the time period. Do we know the time period of the study? So they followed them up for um an average of eight years. Oh, this was the other incredible thing. So they um these are people from the N. Haynes study who are supposed to be reflective of normal American people. So it's not a nurses group or you know any of the health professionals follow up right. study. So they, they had this um, food frequency questionnaire done back in the early noughties. They were followed up for an average of eight years. These guys had an average age of 48 and a half 
at the start of the study, they're then only followed up for an average of eight years. So they're then an average of 56 and a half. During this time, 14% of people in the study were claimed to have died. That That's amazing. <laughs> and by the way, of course, once you hit 50, mortality starts to rise, right? Yeah, but it doesn't hit 14%. Right. right. It doesn't hit. You know, if you started people off on the study and said, right, you guys, it's only a population study. There's no intervention, but we're going to follow you for eight years. You're an average of 48 at the moment. And by the way, one in eight of you are going to die. More than one in eight of you are going to die over the next eight years. You've been like, holy moly. Yeah. What? Uh, that doesn't make sense. Why did so many people die? They don't explain that. It, it's. It's an amazing thing, you know, and, and this made headline. I mean, that's all I saw was IF. IF is going to cause death, not, not cardiovascular disease. Now, the part you're leaving out and the part I always say, on top of everything Zoe just said, folks, on top of all of it, there's always one thing I always talk about when it comes to epidemiological studies, where they're asking people to fill out food questionnaires. Okay. Now, I do this with Gina Grad all the time because Gina is a member of Mensa. So am okay? I. Um, I was going <laughs> to ask you to remember because we, Zoe, I don't have your particulars in front of me, but I mean, you're, <laughs> you went to school, you know, Rhodes Scholar. Wait, wait, no, you went to, where did you I went know? to Cambridge. Yeah. I got a scholarship to read at Cam read maths at Cambridge. All right. Just like Gina Grad, just like our beautiful Gina Grad, beautiful Zoe Harcomb is also a member of Mensa. They're a member of the same society. I'm going to do something right now, and I want you to answer immediately. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> well, I just I want an immediate answer. I want to see how okay. you can answer this. Today is Friday. I want to know what you had for lunch on Tuesday. Oh, where even was I? Yeah, exactly. Where was I Tuesday? Um, yeah, this is a I drove up to see my my family. Mm -hmm. uh, yogurt, berries, and cheese from memory. Okay, yeah. from memory, a Mensa member took at yeah, exactly. least twenty seconds to go back yeah. to try yeah. to figure out what happened on Tuesday. What yeah. did you have for lunch yesterday? Do you know, I don't think I had lunch because I was driving back from a friend. Thinking, you see, it takes. Yeah, it takes, oh. it's it's not there, is it? It's not. We can't recall. Yeah, we I, just I, can't I do it. Get some members what they had for lunch the day before, and yeah. they cannot tell you without. Yeah. They they can't go. Well, it was yogurt and cheese yesterday. She didn't yeah. know. She had to start thinking about yesterday. Now, when they ask people to write down what they've been eating over the past, what they they come what every third or fourth year with most of these studies, or sometimes once a year. What do they do with these food questionnaires? This one they only did twice, and on both times, I'm pretty sure this was a 24-hour recall. Um, yeah, it was two 24-hour recalls. So sometimes they say, what do you typically eat? And they're asking you to base it on what you ate last year. And no way can people remember that. And what about the weekend and what about the weekday? Sometimes they're different. Sometimes people eat differently in the summer to the winter. Um, this was two 24-hour recalls. So what they would be saying is exactly what you just asked me, which is what did you eat yesterday? Now, the fact that I was on the road yesterday, driving back from the southeast and missed lunch, was not typical. I normally have lunch. So what would I put in my 24-hour recall? I have to be honest and say yesterday I didn't have lunch. Right. But that's not typical. So that skews my whole survey. So that does that then put me in a window of eating differently because I didn't have lunch? It's crazy. It's so inaccurate. Not to mention that people, a lot of times, we we will say what we think other people want to hear versus yes. like if a doctor says on, on your thing, do you smoke, right? Yeah. You, you could smoke a pack a day and you might put a pack a week, right? Yeah. Because we put what we think other people want to hear. And yeah. it's not that we're trying to be dishonest. We're trying to, it, it might be, well, I might stop smoking. So mm -hmm. I'm going to put a pack a week. That's what I really want to do. Uh, the other thing is I interview, um, Zoe, I interview people every day, five days a week, people who are doing low carb in SNG. And the typical phone caller will say, I've lost 100 pounds or I've lost 80 pounds and I still have another 75 to lose or 120 to lose or whatever. 
and I've stopped dry. It was working. It's not working anymore. And I'll say, okay, take me through your typical day. And when they take me through their typical day, they're now trying to impress me. Mm -hmm. And I know this. So I have them take me through the day and I'm sitting there going, wow, I wish I can eat as cleanly as they're eating, right? I'll wait a while, we'll talk, and I'll ask them to do it again and again until the truth starts coming Mm -hmm. out. Yeah. I'll start asking, well, what about snacks? Do you have wine? Do you know, is there alcohol? Is there this? And by the end of it, you know, I'm not badgering these people, but I'm I want them to understand what you told me the first time and what you told me the fourth time are two different things. And now we know because your liver is a meritocracy, your liver will never lie. Mm -hmm. right? Whatever you put in is what's going to come out. It's just what it is. But now we're taking people twice in an eight year period. So once every four years, and we're going, okay, what did you eat over the past 24 hours? Mm -hmm. And I now have two Mensa members who have to roll their eyes, look up into (laughs) the air and go, I don't know. (laughs) Trying to remember. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not even accurate to start with. Yeah. So when you take that on top of everything else, and then you have and then you have mixed group, you know, the numbers aren't even. So you're skewing. I don't know if they wanted to do that on purpose, or they thought they couldn't find enough people. But you're right, usually people who don't eat breakfast are people who stay out late and wake up Mm -hmm. late and eat junk when they do wake up, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're burned out from the night before. So Anything else we need to know about the study? Yeah, a couple of things, actually. I mean, one of the things is that they didn't just look at cardiovascular disease mortality. They looked at all-cause mortality, and they looked at cancer mortality. And I have to refer to my notes on this one. So they they basically presented the results with a number of different permutations. So they had the all-cause mortality, the cardiovascular disease mortality, the cancer mortality. They had them subgrouped by all people people who had heart disease at baseline and people who had cancer at baseline. And then they compared four different eating windows with that reference group. So the under eight hours, the 10 to 12 hours, the 12 to 14 hours and the more than 16 hours. So there ended up being 36 different findings that they looked at. 32 of those found nothing whatsoever. So that should have been the headline. We looked at a whole lot of data over eight years, 20,000 people, 32 out of 36 things found nothing. There was a spurious result in cancer, which was that in people with cancer, there was an association with lower cancer deaths only in the group that was eating for more than 16 hours a day. And you think, well, what's the plausible mechanism for that? Is it because people with cancer, cancer treatment tend to lose a lot of weight? If you're managing to eat for more than 16 hours a day, maybe that's a good sign. I don't even think they tried to explain that one because it was just the poster presentation. But then all the findings were basically just this one eating window, the below eight hours compared with the 12 to 16 hours, the 2% compared with the 60%, the tiny number of deaths. And that was the only situation in which they found anything. So the vast majority of this found nothing. And the global headlines ended up being based on 0.15% of the people who'd been studied. So this was complete and utter nonsense. And to think that those type of headlines could last for years, you know, the the implications of those headlines, people are going to believe that. Now, I can't tell you how many people have on the consults. It's like, hey, I do IF. Will Mm -hmm. I die? Am I I, I at risk? Dr. Fung told me to eat this way. And it's like, no, 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 you're finally doing something right. With, yeah. You know, you're losing weight, your A1Cs are down, you, your fatty liver disease seems to be curing itself, which they'll mm-hmm. tell you, you can never do. Uh, your sleep apnea has gone away. I, I yeah. think you're healthier now than you were when you started this process. So continue yeah. on. Um, before we get into breast cancer, because I want to, it seems like a salacious headline from you, actually. It was like, whoa, <laughs> like, wait, is Zoe going to the other <laughs> side? Bring up salacious headlines. Before we do that, folks, Villa Capelli olive oil is uh, the best olive oil on the planet. Now, listen, I have a bias. These people actually pay me to say nice things about their olive oil, but I ain't lying. I'm Italian. Okay. We know good olive oil. I used to say back in the day when I first started going to Italy, 
I was like, wait, am I being romanticized by the fact that I'm in Rome and I'm looking at water and I'm eating fish and there's this wonderful olive oil? But everywhere I seemed to go in Italy, the olive oil was just better. And then I uh, started doing research when Anna Vocino and I started this podcast. We started learning that um, olive oil in this country is cut, and it can be cut up to 40%, and we can still call it 100% pure olive oil. That's a fact. There's been books written on it. Uh, Extra Virginity talks about it uh, in that book. Folks, you want to get the good stuff. You don't want to have to get an olive oil that's got 40% seed oils, then they have to add an odor back in to make it smell like olive oil, and they have to add a colorant to make it look like olive oil. Get the real thing to begin with. If it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, and that's what Villa Capelli is. <clears throat> Go get the best olive oil on the planet. Go to vinnytartarus.com, click through the Villa Capelli banner, or go straight to villacapelli.com. Either way, put in promo code Vinny at the end, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, and you'll get 10% off your entire order. So go check that out right now. We're talking to Zoe Harcomb. Um, Zoe, I, I saw one of your headlines. It, it was a two-parter. It was uh, breast cancer, uh, to screen or not to screen. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, we, we have the Susan B. Komen Foundation. We got this, we got that. Everybody's telling us, go get your screening. You got to get screen, screen, left, right, and center. I know that these screenings are painful. I hear that from my wife. You know, they, they have to squish your breast. I couldn't imagine having my, my testicles squished in the machine to see if I have testicle cancer. This has to be similar, right? What, what's going on with that? What made you look into it and what did you find? Um, what made me look into it was I received a, an invitation for breast screening. So I got something from Public Health Wales. I'm based in Wales. Um, the same would happen for any women in in any country, I guess. There are different ages at which it's triggered. Um, in the UK, you're going to get an invitation to screen in any time from 50. And there are people saying it should be earlier. Um, some countries will screen up to a certain age. Some it's 60, some it's 70. Um, it does vary. But at some point in your life, a woman is going to get an invite from their local health board, whatever the equivalent is, saying, um, here's your invitation to, to come to screen him. What was particularly interesting about this booklet, because I read stuff like that, I don't just book the appointment as most women would do, oh, you know, like you say, screening, it must be really, really valuable, I must go along. Um, there was a trade-off that was described in the booklet, and I've got the exact words in front of me, and it was telling us before we book our screening appointment for every one woman who has life saved, her life saved from breast cancer, about three women are diagnosed with a cancer that would never have become life threatening. So I wrote back to Public Health Wales and I said, nobody's going to be saved. We're all going to die. So what you're talking about is life extension. By how much longer is somebody going to live if they have breast cancer screening, um, what exactly are you saying about the three women who are getting diagnosed with a cancer that wouldn't have become life threatening? Are you then saying that you get a second opinion and it's just all dismissed and nothing happens? And they replied to me and said, um, all of this is in a report written by Sir Michael Marmot, who is kind of Mr. Public Health in the UK. And he did this report and I looked at the report and they probably thought, I'm not going to look at it. It's, I don't know, 70 pages long or whatever. I'll just say, oh, thanks very much. Book my appointment. But of course, this is what I do. So right. the reason this is a two-parter is I spent so long researching this. And it started referencing another report by Dr. Peter Gercher. And I know Dr. Peter Gercher. I've presented at conferences with him a couple of times. He's the guy who set up the Cochrane Foundation. And the Cochrane Foundation was the one that did true evidence-based medicine. It was not funded by the pharmaceutical industry. And then, of course, over the years, it did get compromised by the pharmaceutical industry. And they managed to get rid of Dr. Peter Gercher. And they didn't like a couple of the things that he'd done. So he had done some research into things like breast cancer screening. That's the one, one of the things they didn't like. He did some research into the HPV vaccine and they didn't like that either. But he was just looking at the evidence. So I started off by looking at the Marmot report, which I'd been sent by Public Health Wales. And I looked at the Peter Gercher report at the same time. So I'm looking at about 120 pages between the two documents and very reassuringly, they had come across the same trials. So there are fewer than 10 intervention trials 
in this area, some of them but very big with tens of thousands of women, where essentially back in sort of the 1960s or 70s, they'd have said, right, randomly, you 10,000 women have breast cancer screening, randomly, you 10,000 don't. And let's see what happens over a long period of time. So it's another um, sort of study that takes place over a long period of time. Did the women who have the breast cancer screening have a much better outcome than the women who didn't, which is kind of, I guess, what they were expecting to find. Right. So they found the same trials. And here is when they diverged. So Marmot said, I'm going to include all the trials. And if you include all the trials and you pull them in that technique called meta-analysis, which is just pooling together all the evidence available, then he'd say relative risk. I think there's about a 20 percent um, benefit from doing breast cancer screening. Now, that 20 percent ends up being absolutely tiny in terms of absolute risk. But what Peter Gercher said was, no, there's some of those trials that you have simply got to exclude because they were not robust enough. They didn't randomly allocate people properly. They they either allocated them by clinic and then they put a whole clinic in one arm. And if that clinic was in an affluent area and the other clinic was in a non-affluent area, you haven't got a randomized control trial anymore. You've got something that, is, that has been um, destroyed in terms of quality. So he then said, if we look at only these trials, and that still included a lot of women, I think it was somewhere around 400,000, half a million women, just look at those trials, there's no difference whatsoever. And yet, there is a difference in harm, because both of them were accepting this three women are diagnosed with a cancer that would not have become life threatening. It wasn't they then went on to have a second opinion and everything was okay. They got treated for breast cancer thinking that they had breast cancer and they didn't have a breast cancer that was going to go on to be life threatening. And, and Peter Gercher has devoted over 20 years of his academic career to this. He feels like he's been screaming into the void. Other researchers have come out and said and found the same things and they have been attacked relentlessly by an industry that is worth a lot of money. I mean, the screening industry is worth a heck of a lot of money. Four women then go on to have breast cancer treatment. One of them would have benefited from that breast cancer treatment because she had breast cancer, but the other three actually didn't have a breast cancer that was gonna become life-threatening. So she should have lived with that condition. And we're talking about breasts, we're talking about mastectomies, breasts being cut off. We're talking about radiotherapy. We're talking about chemotherapy, which in itself is life shortening because there were so many people, they err on the side of caution. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm a guy that, you know, I went through leukemia and they said, you know, now we have it down to a chronic level which means it's going to grow back within your bone marrow and then we're going to knock it down again. And they told me the, the, the long and short was somewhere between four and five years, right? You'll be back on chemo. And I remember chemo like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I went, okay, I want to do everything in my power. That's when I went into, you know, just being living in a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do everything in my power to make this grow back as slowly as possible. Mm -hmm. Because if I could get six years out of it, or seven, or even 10, that's better than every five years, because I know what taking on those chemicals, when they're trying to kill cancer in your cells, they're killing you too. Yeah, that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, breast cancer. And look, folks, I, I, I know women are screaming at this podcast right now. My sister died and I had the BRCA gene. That's a different story. Th yeah. That's not what we're talking about here, Zoe, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah, correct. We're talking about healthy women being invited for screening. And the, the screening is going to find one woman who's got breast cancer who then, and we can get into what life saved actually means because we're all going to die. But I had no idea that three women end up getting different levels of treatment. They're not all going to get mastectomy and radiotherapy and chemotherapy. It's going to be various combinations of all of those, but they didn't actually need it. And when people say, oh, chemotherapy saved my sister or saved my life or whatever, you don't actually know because you don't know. In fact, you actually had three times the odds of being one of the women who were treated and, and you were never going to die from this anyway, as opposed right. to the one woman who had the treatment who really did need that intervention at that time. Yeah. And, and look, you know, going back to myself with my blood cancer, I know it's coming back. 
right? There's no avoiding it. But I've gone 17 years now. Wow. It might be back this year. You know, I'm, I'm going through tests right now. And um, I, you know, it, it could be at a level where they have, oh, we're gonna have to give you a little chemo here and get you going again. Which so I, I am not averse to, you know, to any kind of medicine that can save your life. But I also know that every time I go on chemo, it's I'm taking years off of my life. Yeah. You know, I always thought I'd be healthy into my 90s. But every time you go through chemo, you can knock a few more years off that that's yeah. a fact. Yeah. You know, um, so so yeah, if three out of four women are having their breasts zapped, and by the way, radiation, uh, my best friend was a radiation oncologist, and she'll tell you this stuff is harsh, yeah. even though it's pinpointed right at the tumor and this, it's harsh. Yeah, right. And on top of that, you know, uh, you know, taking, you know, the, the chemicals and just all of it, it's, it's rough. It's rough. Yeah. Um, and look, we, we went through this thing, you know, a few celebrities in this country. Went, oh, I have the BRCA gene. Yank yeah. my female plumbing, lop my breast off. I'm good to go yeah. <clears throat> with no cancer. And yeah. I didn't know if, I thought that was a bit dangerous that celebrities were doing this and talking about it. Um, was it Angelina Jolie, I think? Yes, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. And, and that's very influential. Yeah, she's a very influential woman and the whole thing. And you go, okay, it's one of the sexiest women on the planet. And she's doing this. Should I be doing this? Yeah. The answer is, we don't know. Yeah. But that's, that's harsh. When you're Angelina Jolie and you have all the money in the world and you have the best doctor care at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, that's one thing, right? But we don't know if she needed to do that. She just knew that she had the BRCA gene or yeah. one of the mutations that can cause a problem down the road. Could it have become a problem? Did she go too far? And did she convince other women to go too far? Yeah. Would you agree? Yes, yeah. Um, do I know if she went too far? I don't know. And I don't know what decision I would make. But it's a it's a really big decision, as you say. I mean, the, the body's response to being mutilated in that way has got to be fairly catastrophic um, in terms of inflammation, trying to heal the area. It, it's not a small operation. That's a real onslaught as far as the body is concerned. Um, I don't know. I would need, I would really need to look into that. If I, somebody told me you've got that kind of gene and thankfully I've got no female family history of breast cancer, let alone early breast cancer or anything. So, you know, touch wood, that's not kind of what's the, uh, the bad thing in my family. Um, but yeah, it was influential. And is that the right thing to do? Was she asked to come out and say that because it would encourage other people to go that route? I don't know. Speaking of celebrity, and I'm going to make mm, this is a hard laugh. I mean, we're going 90 degrees off center here. But you mentioned HPV. Um, and the funny thing is, is I just had a conversation with my good friend, uh, Mr. Don Coddington. It's the billionaire Don Coddington's Friday, five o'clock. Don and I were having a conversation just the other day. And sometimes we talk about nonsensical things. And I said, Don, whatever happened to HPV? And he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, five years ago, everything was HPV, human papillomavirus, mm -hmm. everything. You couldn't walk outside without a hearing about HPV. And then a celebrity came into it, uh, Michael Douglas, yeah, and said, hey, I have throat cancer because of cunnilingus. And I'm pretty sure I got that. By the way, no science. There yeah. was exactly, and maybe you could tell me I'm wrong, Zoe, zero science. This guy goes, I had a lot of cunnilingus and now I have throat cancer. And uh, I think it's because I, I was doing this sexually my entire life. Now, Michael Douglas, I don't know if he was a smoker, but you know, <laughs> celebrities back in those days smoked to keep their weight off. Yeah. And God only knows, I'm sure he did his, his share of Coke and every other drug that, that was out there. I'm assuming, but I think my assumptions are pretty close to dead center. Yet he's blaming something else on his throat cancer. And that brought a lot of light to HPV. And mm -hmm. I know my my stepdaughter had the shots and, and the treatment, you know, the, the, the go get this, go get that. 
And, you know, a lot of people's kids did. So we had this whole conversation just a week ago, and then you bring up HPV again today. Where are we on HPV? Or do you have any information on that? Or why was it so big five years ago? Was it COVID became like the new hot thing? So we stopped talking about HPV? What happened to HPV? And is it a concern? Oh, God, that's really interesting. So my brother was diagnosed with a really bad cancer about, well, May 2017, still doing incredibly well. I mean, they gave him months and he's just still fantastic after years. So he's obviously doing something right as well. And we sat down and we told his two girls and they were eight and 11, I think. And one of them said, and I thought this was really interesting when he said, um, girls, just want to let you know, I've just been diagnosed with cancer. One of them said, can we catch it? And of course, we said, no, 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 you, you don't catch cancer. It's something that kind of goes wrong in the body and it's just gone wrong in daddy's body. And that's kind of how it is. But HPV has always baffled me and I need to look at it because the implication of the whole HPV program is that you can catch cancer or that you can catch right. this virus that is going to increase your risk of getting cancer, which is just one step away from catching cancer. So... I don't know. I I would not put my life on the fact that a virus is causing certain cancers. I know it has become assumed that it is, but what if it is the case that because you can vaccinate against a virus, you can then introduce another thing that makes a lot of money for a drug company right. with this suggestion that one is connected to the other? I don't definitively know. I could not put my life on the truism that HPV as a virus causes certain cancers. I just don't know. I haven't looked at it in that kind of detail. And then does the vaccine prevent the HPV virus? Again, I don't know what the efficacy rate on that is. I know it's more of a traditional vaccine than the whole sort of COVID mRNA stuff, but I don't know the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the efficacy on that. Can I ask you to put some of your Monday stuff aside and look into that at some point? Yeah, no, I should, shouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I've done another podcast before this one yeah. in a very dry room. So, uh, no, take your time there. Sometimes I, finally I got Zoe all choked up over there. Right? <laughs> you have it in your throat. Yeah. Maybe I do. Maybe I do. Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden you start um, to yeah there's I, another interesting thing that if you look at, Certainly the UK data and Cancer UK has got incredible data. If you look at cervical cancer in the UK and you look at the introduction of the HPV vaccine, cancer, cervical cancer rates go up in the UK following the introduction of the vaccine. And that's very interesting. There could be reasons for that. One reason could be that because HPV is a sexually transmitted virus, People might think, oh, I'm protected now so I can have riskier sex. But we are talking largely about women, teenagers and in their 20s. Do right. they have that kind of mentality about risky sex anymore? I don't know. But I'm just saying there is an association that shows cancer going up after the HPV vaccine was introduced. And I don't know why that is. So it is something I need to look into a, a number of different angles um, but sometimes these aren't Monday notes. These are almost sort of PhD topics. So I have to pick them carefully. Right. No, I, I get that. It, it seems like a deeper dive than what you, you can normally pull out in a week. I, I still don't know how you do what you do. Do you have a team? <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a team or is it just you and your husband? Who? Just me. <clears throat> just me doing the research and the writing. Yeah. That's a crazy amount of research to do yeah. in one week to figure things out. I mean, I couldn't imagine. Yeah, and you're right. This is a much bigger subject. But look, I think we're the last generation. I'm not speaking for Zoe here. I'm more or less speaking for myself. And I was an American. I don't know what they're doing over in Wales. But, you know, sex was kind of, we, we were the end of the sexual revolution. And I, I know it's hard for kids to believe. Now, I'll talk to my nephews about this. It's like, no, we were having just sports sex back in the late 70s, early 80s, right? When we were young, it was... It wasn't a deal, right? It wasn't like a big deal. You know, we, whether we knew what we were doing or not, sex was just kind of free, right? And it wasn't what it is now. And I think, I think the kids today are more discerning. A lot of kids aren't having sex from what I'm understanding. And male testosterone is way down and all this different mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So 
you might have to look at to look into that when you're looking yeah. at this, yeah. the, whole, the thing as a whole, you know, how much is sex down? And can we actually figure that out from community to community? May, there could be countries in Africa where they're having sex around the clock mm -hmm. and in other countries, you know, other places in, in, in Australia where no one's having sex. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. I think the Aussies like having sex. I, I think it's <laughs> a fun loving group, like them and the Irish, you know, <laughs> sex or something. Sweeping generalizations there. That's I brilliant. pretty close though, Zoe, especially. Yeah, 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 Irish. you might be, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the Irish will say, look at you, you bastard. And that's like a hello. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. funny. Hey, we, we, a bitch, and then say, wait, what did you just call me? It's like, no, he was saying hi. <laughs> there's one thing on breast cancer that we mustn't we mustn't miss out on so do you remember when i said to public health wales we're all going to die so i'm interested in life extension if you're telling me that the average woman is going to gain 50 years and three women are each going to lose a couple of years then okay that that might be a so long as i'm the one woman and not the three women that might be an okay right. trade-off so the claimed life extension and i had to really look at this marmot report to find out where this number was was 27 days. Now, what they then did, they said, if 100 women go for breast cancer screening, and I think off the top of my head, these are quite accurate numbers, something like 93, that they're not going to know anything anyway, or, or it's probably actually even 96 are not going to be told they've got anything. One is going to be the one who's told she's got breast cancer, and she probably does need treatment. And three, are going to be told and, and they didn't actually need treatment but what they then do is they say all of those other women if it had been them they would have got 27 days as well so basically they allocate all the 27 days for all the women who get screened and they give it to that one person who was the lucky one who did actually have breast cancer and did actually need to have some treatment so she ends up gaining let's say 17 years on average but if the three women and your own personal story, which I didn't realize, I'm sorry to hear that, they end up losing six years each, right. you're in net deficit already, aside from the fact that you're three times more likely to be the women harmed unnecessarily than you are to be the one woman who was saved, in inverted commas. Yeah. So I'm not, the long and short of it is I, I'm not going to the screening appointment. And there was a, the, the Canadian study was the one that swung it from me. There was a massive Canadian study and in, in almost all the groups, the control group was do nothing. So you guys have screening, you guys do nothing, just carry on as normal. In the Canadian study, they said, right, you lot go for screening. The control group, we're actually going to do um, self-examination and practitioner examination. So it wasn't a do nothing control group. And that was a study that found no difference whatsoever between self-examination and expert examination and going for screening. So kind of where I got to was, I'm going to do self-examination and go to practitioner examination. If that's as likely to detect a lump as doing that screening thing, and then I end up going down a very bad pathway, I'm just going to check my own things. We know that there's any discharge, there's any lump, and we know how to do sort of, you know, all under your arms, and we know how to do all of that kind of thing. Just do it regularly, girls. Do it regularly, women. Think about whether or not screening is right for you. Wait, hang on. I, I, I might be a little confused here because I was going to bring up a point to say, why not get screened anyway and then make a decision by going? Because I always tell people when you get a cancer diagnosis, get three opinions and do not ask that doctor to introduce you to his best friend doctor down the hall. Yeah. Go get three separate opinions. That, that's what I, I do on everything. So what is the difference? I'm confused now, Zoe. Um, what is the difference between going to your practitioner and, you know, they tell women check once a week when you're in the shower, you're in the shower anyway, feel around under yeah. your armpits and the whole thing yeah. and fine. <clears throat> What's the difference between your practitioner and a screening? Is the screening the, the mush test? Is that what we're talking about? What? Yeah, so it's, it's when you go in for um, a mammogram, so right. you go in, um, you strip from the waist up, they put your boobs on this um, flat platelet chet um, uh, sort of plate. Um, and, and women will have debates about this. And, and then there's no benefit. If you've got big boobs, they literally just slap your boob on the table and then try oh. to squish it down. If you've got small boobs, I don't even know how they do it. So 
um, what are they trying to do then? Just squeeze the tissue around to try to get some sort of thing. And there's damage in that. So they're probably damaging your breast tissue. Does that then set off triggers that start mutating things in the area? I don't know. It's Thank you. I've been asking that question for a thousand years. It's like... It has to do some harm. Out of it. Yeah. Is that causing something to happen? It might. It's like, at the very least, it's got to cause some kind of you know, fibroid thing to happen. Yeah. You know, because whenever we do something, our bodies have to react to it. Yeah. I've been asking that question for years and doctors have told me, oh, no, the trade-off, the trade-off, the trade-off is there. So, all right, now you got me mad. <laughs> so that screening could be harmful to your health. At the yeah. very least, it could be uh, uh, painful. Um, and we can learn just as much by going to a doctor and let him feel around to see if he feels any kind of growth happening. But the Canadian study would suggest that. I wouldn't want to categorically say that, but the okay. Canadian study would suggest you get, there's no difference in doing the manual test than there is this, this screening, the, okay, the mammography. Let's say, you, let's say you went to a screening today and, and Zoe, you became one of the four women. Yeah. Now you become one of the four, but we don't know if you're the one or the three. Yeah. Right. Because we know three on statistics, three are not going to have a problem. Yeah. Do you go, oh, geez, they just did this. Let's go right into cancer protocol. Or do you go, okay, the screening did this. I now need a second, third, and fourth opinion. Well, I would, but how many women will just take the advice of the doctor because the doctor then puts you in this panic situation of oh we've got your result i mean first of all you get a phone call saying oh you've got an abnormal result you panic you go into terror horror mode call your family in everyone goes into meltdown can't think about anything else you get called in um yeah we're really sorry that something showed up on the mammogram show you on the screen you're down a pathway then and it what I've heard from from friends who've had cancer is the pressure that they then feel, oh, we can get you in tomorrow. We just need to check your blood group and do the pre um, hospitalization infection test, C. difficile and uh, all that kind of thing. And then we can get you in tomorrow. And you're in you're swept up in this pathway and people need to take the time to step back and go, yo, hang on a second. Um, how do I get that second opinion? If they just repeat the mammogram, is it just going to show exactly the same thing? And it might well do. It's showing something, but it's more than likely benign. They don't know that until they start doing a biopsy. Start doing a biopsy, that's the squash in your breasts and then some. We know that that is inflammatory. We know a number of people who work in the field of cancer that say just the biopsy alone is going to, it's like, um, somebody put it to me a bit crudely, is it's like bursting a zit. Um, right. You just know it's going to make more of a mess and it's probably going to spread around the zit area and you're best off leaving it alone. So the biopsy itself is quite aggressive and we are now coming up with better biopsy techniques. Um, I saw something recently on, is it blood biopsies or liquid biopsies or something? So you're not quite sort of bursting into the area in the um, aggressive way that we are doing at the moment, but you're down this pathway and suddenly they're saying, oh, you better be getting in and having radiotherapy and um, you know, the, the Princess of Wales in the UK at the moment has just come out saying, I'm having preventative chemotherapy. What the hell is that? I, I, I wasn't going to bring it up because I, I don't know what's real and what's not, because, you know, we get a lot of British news around here because I live with a Brit. Um, what's we don't know what's going on with her, right? Or No, we don't know. We know that she went into hospital in January. Um, they say it was for an elective procedure rather than a, um, an emergency procedure, but there were a number of things that were then cleared in her diary. So how much was elective? How much was we really need to do it now? We don't know. We know that she was in hospital for a period of two weeks and I'm in a doctor chat group. And inevitably at the time we were chatting saying, what keeps a healthy, all, all appearances, healthy, beautiful young woman in hospital for two weeks? And we couldn't think of a stomach procedure. And, and you know, of course, some people were saying, oh, maybe it's a hysterectomy. No, you're out after a hysterectomy within right. 24 to 48 hours. And they would try to get somebody royal out even faster than an average person, because right. having royalty in a hospital is a security utter nightmare because you've got porters going in, you've got cleaners going in, you've got patients going in, you've got visitors going in. 
to to screen everyone so that you're protecting a, a really close member of the royal family is a complete and utter nightmare. So trust me that the second they can get her out of that hospital, she's got great care at home. The doctor can go and live with her at Windsor Castle. She is not the kind of person who's, why was she in for two weeks for a, an elective procedure? What exactly is a stomach operation? Is it something bowel? Is it something gynecological? Um, they didn't think it was cancer at the time. And then it took quite a period of time before they then realized actually, yeah, this probably is cancerous. Again, that doesn't make sense because that might happen for me. I'm not special, but a member of the royal family, you do an operation, you take away a piece of tissue, they're going to find out if it's cancerous within hours, not weeks. So we're all a bit baffled at the moment, to be to be quite well, honest. My, my thought was when I heard that they did prophylactic chemo, I went, okay, that's never been done in history. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to do prophylactic. It's like saying I'm going to put a cast on because I'm going mountain biking and I might break my leg. <laughs> Perfect. It, it, it makes that kind of sense, right? Yeah. Um. So I, I, and I hope I'm. I want to be wrong about this. I think she might have an aggressive cancer, and they're just not willing to talk about it. And their lies are not doing them any good, right? Whoever's doing the press for this poor woman, I, I hope they figure it out because you know, lying about what's going on with her is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And when you say, Oh, she's got a touch of cancer, or Oh, they're doing this prophylactically. That makes even less sense. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, um, I, I hope she's okay. Uh, I she do. Seems to do good work. Uh, yeah. They both seem to do good work uh, in the UK and, and around the world. So but you know, I'm not a she praying man, but I, I, I hope that um, she she's in my thoughts. Yeah, me too. I mean, I think of her as a mum of three young children. Um, by all intents and purposes, she seems to be a terrific mum as well. And you just think of those poor children, any, any parent going through cancer, it's, um, I think it's a bigger deal than someone who's not a parent going through cancer. It's an even bigger deal because your children are dependent on you. And it must kill you to think you might not be there for them. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people go, oh, I'm not feeling sorry for them because they're raw. You know, they got all the money in the world. My, folks, money, money is, does not make a difference. And you get cancer, it's an even playing field. It mm -hmm. really is an even playing field. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I've always feel sorry for celebrities. I've worked, as you know, Zoe, I worked with celebrities for four, uh, 30 of my 40 years. And, um, I often felt sorry for the really big ones because they live in a prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have the mansion, they have the cars, they have the life, they have it. They cannot walk out of their houses. Yeah. And yeah. this one, you know, once you decide to marry a royal, she mm -hmm. married into this, her life, you know, she walked into prison that day. Yeah. And I don't think anyone can realize what prison they're walking into. Yeah. Right. Look what happened to his mother, to Lady yeah. Diana. That prison ended up killing her. Mm -hmm. Right. I think yeah. the woman would still be around today had she not been in that that lifestyle. Oh, right? if she'd have stayed a nursery nurse and never met Charles, whatever, she'd now be a socialite. Yeah. I mean, she was well connected. She'd have married well. She'd be yeah. happy, healthy, no doubt. Well, yeah, she's she I want to think she's about my age. I think she would have been 61. I, 62. I think she would have been actually. Yeah, I think yeah. she would. Yeah. And it's sad to think that, you know, when I think about all of that, you know, someone was telling me that you know, we have this girl, um, uh, Taylor Swift, and oh my gosh, she's got it made. It's like, no, she doesn't. It, the woman can't walk mm -hmm. down the street. Yeah. All the money in the world, she cannot walk down the street. Is that is that freedom or is that jail? Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And to have to go through cancer and have to lie and go, oh, I might have a touch of cancer. We're going to do this prophylactically. Uh, you know, I just hope if you're a praying person, pray for this woman because uh, mm -hmm. she needs help. Um, yeah. I was going to get into kimchi, but it, can, can we do? Can we do? I know we're running late. Can we do three minutes on kimchi? I'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is my Monday note coming up next week, and again, it was one that just made so many headlines, and it said. Um, three portions of kimchi, I think it was, are going to reduce the size of your beer belly. 
And it was a study that came out of Korea and the conflicts of interest were just there up front. So two of the authors worked for the Kimchi World Institute of Kimchi World Institute of Kimchi had funded the study. So, you know, it was going to come out with some good things. And it was right. just all over the place. First of all, all the, all the headlines in the West were about obesity. And then you go and look at the definition of obesity in the paper. And because this study was done in Korea, and they don't have obese people in Korea. So right. they call obesity a BMI over 25. <laughs> that would be an athlete in america yeah exactly that that's kind of normal so first of all we're not talking about obesity and then again their definition of beer belly abdominal obesity was nothing like the western you know it was sort of like 80 centimeters or something i mean again you know you'd say well that's a cheerleader in the yeah. uh, in the in the nfl i mean it was just utterly ridiculous and then they found some things for men but there was nothing for women they found some things if you had two portions of kimchi but not if you had four and what people don't realize in studies is you've got to have a plausible mechanism for whatever you're claiming. So if you're saying that red meat causes diabetes and diabetes is about glucose and red meat has got no glucose, you've got to have a plausible mechanism because otherwise it's just not even possible. And this didn't have a plausible mechanism. And I did this rapid response in the BMJ. So if you go to kimchi obesity, BMJ, you'll find the paper. There's one rapid response at the moment, which is mine. And it starts off by saying this isn't even about obesity. And nobody called that out. And then it doesn't make sense because it found this and it didn't found this. And it found this for men and not for women. It found this for two portions, not for three portions. It found this for kim this kimchi and not for this type of kimchi. You've got to have a plausible mechanism, guys. How does this even get through peer review? And yet they all do get through peer review because nobody is actually that, doing proper peer review. That's the problem that, and by the way, uh, folks, Zoe said 80 centimeters. If I'm doing my math, that's like, that's less than 32 inches. Um, a 32 inch waist. I think I did that right. I'm pretty good at doing centimeters to inches. Yeah, so. 90, 30 centimeters is 12 inches. If you think of the ruler. Like so five or something yeah, like it's that. Not, it's, it's not big. Yeah. See, I'm not even in Mensa and I'm guessing that. <laughs> now I got to look it up. Hang on. 80 centimeters. You see, I should be in Mensa. 80 centimeters is 31.49. And I said, oh, it's got to be about 31.5. There you and go. I'm not even yeah, you know your no, waist no. sizes. Yeah, I know waist sizes. <laughs> Put me in the group, please. Um, yeah, you know, look, I was on uh, the Adam Carolla show once, and uh, they used to like to hit me on the air with stuff. And they went, hey, we got this big study here that says that eating pasta is actually going to help you lose weight and great for, you know, reduces heart disease and the whole thing. And without knowing anything else, I said, who did the study? Yeah. And they went to the bottom and they went, uh, Barilla. Barilla, yeah. <laughs> the biggest pasta company in Italy did the study on yeah. pasta. Before. And I just read one on my Monday show. If folks, if you go back now, two weeks, you know, Anna brought one up where they were talking about coffee, um, lowering mortality and this whole thing. And we, we also know that the AHA finally got on board saying that, coffee is actually healthy for you, you know, for every cup you drink. Now, listen, I own a boutique coffee company. I would love for that to be true. But I'm the first one to say, if the AHA is look is, is saying that you got to start looking at where that came from. Mm -hmm. And the study we looked at on mortality last week, it was done by Nestle, who owns a little company called Nescafe within their Nescafe. group, which sells a lot of coffee. So you can't look at these things and go, oh, wait, drink more. And by the way, I personally think coffee is the healthiest drink in the world next to water, right? It's the number one drink next to water in the world. But you have to look at these studies. Even if you're me and you own a boutique coffee company, you have to look at the studies and go, where did this come from? How real is it? Yeah. I would love for it to be real because it helps my bottom line. I just can't sit here and go, I know this to be a fact. Yeah. All I can say is that these studies are out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. They're getting peer reviewed. How's that happening? How's JAMA? How is, uh, you know, uh, well, we know Lancet has been bought and sold by, you know, and it, we, we can go on and on about Lancet, but what's happening with these peer review studies? Why are they getting pushed through? Who's doing this? So there's there's agendas with a lot. I mean, we know there's the Eat Lancet diet, there's a global agenda to drive us towards plant based food 
Um, right. And it, it's just a massive global agenda. So you get, I mean, for Harvard, for example, so we had the Harvard Public School of Health, and then it became the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. And 350 million apparently went from whoever this T. Chan is to Harvard. And suddenly Harvard start pumping out anti-meat papers, pro-grain papers, pro-fruit and veg papers. So there are conflicts at the university level, not just at the researcher level. And because the chosen narrative is take drugs, eat plants, if you're a researcher and you're going to publish a paper saying take drugs and eat plants, you will get funding. If you're a researcher going in there saying, well, I want people to fast and do a low carb diet and really to avoid as many drugs as possible, you're not going to get any funding for your study. You're just not. So the system creates the narrative that it wants and it perpetuates that narrative. Now, what can happen in, in peer review? Because I've had 20 published papers published and they were really difficult to get published, trust me, because I'm going against the narrative. So my PhD papers were basically saying there's no evidence against dietary fat. There's no evidence against saturated fat. Um, I've had other papers published about how bad the dietary guidelines are. So they're going against the narrative. But when you go into the peer review process, a lot of people don't realize this, you submit your paper and then because they're lazy rascals, even though they're going to charge people 40 bucks to view your paper, unless you pay two to three thousand dollars to have your paper on open view, they're going to get the money either, either way. When you think that a book can cost eight bucks and you're paying 40 bucks for one paper, they're going to make a lot of money. So they want a papers published there. I get emails every day, tens of them saying, can we publish your next paper? It's like, I'm not doing papers anymore. Leave me alone. So they're lazy. They're going to make a lot of money. So you submit your paper. They make you do all the work on the graphics, the abstract, give me the keywords, give me the three things, all those little box outs that you see on the paper. You've done all of that work. Then they say, recommend some people to peer review this. So I could put um, Vinnie Tortovich, David Diamond, Malcolm Kendrick, Ben Bickman, um, Michael Leeds, Peter Bruckner. I could put a list and say, okay, they're going to pick three of those, but actually I like all of those. Now, right. the irony is in our world, because I have been asked to peer review papers and I realize that it's one from our world, but because what I do is tear papers apart, I can also tear papers apart from our side less easily because they actually do tend to be more robust because they're less likely to get published so they just tend to be non-conflicted non inappropriately funded well researched and so on um but you can take them apart but if you're within the narrative side 99.9% .9 of reviewers are actually looking for a paper that says take drugs eat plants so they see a, a paper that says take drugs, eat plants, and they're like, oh, brilliant. And it's from Harvard. Just rubber stamp it. They're all Mensa people up there. It must be brilliant. So nobody is doing what I do. It's just to go to the numbers and say, that's ridiculous, putting 2% of people in one group and 31 deaths. Don't, you know, give me a break. Nobody is doing that. They're just reading the paper. They don't know how to dissect papers. They think if it's Harvard, it'll be okay boom, it gets published. And then I have to try to take it apart. But nobody, re you know, hardly anybody reads what I do. And everybody re reads the IF headlines, red meat diabetes headlines. So it's becoming part of the academic narrative, all of this stuff that is just wrong. It's just false. Yeah. And look, it drives me nuts. You, you're, you, you're a PhD. Nina is now a PhD. Yay, brilliant. Got that because you know people go well, why should we listen to her she's an author yeah. right not anymore she went yeah. through and got her phd yeah. and uh so i'm glad that there are more of you out there going this is hogwash we need to look closer at this stuff uh tell people zoe where they can find your newsletter your books everything that that let them know where they can find you okay brilliant can i just add one other phd though which is um mariam damassi you must have had Marianne on your show. If you haven't, you have to get her on. The problem is, is that I've asked, uh, I've met with her in person. We had dinner one night uh, somewhere at some event. Very interesting woman. Um, she's the Aussie, right? She's Australian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she got kicked off the air for telling the truth. She was yeah. a, a presenter. Um, yeah. I've asked her to come on several times and she's always declined. And, and uh, we That's see eye to eye on everything. And I'm not sure why she's declining it's always i'm working on this and i don't okay. want to say anything about that yet i'm not sure why she doesn't come on but okay. i'm a big fan of everything she's yeah, doing she's, she's good yeah she's really good yeah. and she's worked a lot with peter gercher 
Um, so she's also very familiar with a lot of the HPV research, um, breast cancer research. Where can people find me? I'm at Zoe Harkham on Twitter. You've got my name up on the screen there. And my website is just zoeharkham.com. Um, and that's it, really. Go check out everything she's doing. Zoe, I'm going to ask you on the air because I know within three weeks or a month or two months, you're going to write something that's going to be right up my alley again. So you're going to have to come back on. So. <laughs> In about three weeks, I'm in Spain. I can't wait because we've had such crap weather in the UK. Yeah. I want to go get some vitamin D. Or where, where are you heading? Uh, Gran, yeah, to the Canary Islands, basically. Oh, so, um, yeah, they're lovely. This, uh, come oh, on. They're, let's, they're let's lovely at this time of year. I'll bring Serene and we can have a great time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that would be good, actually. I mean, we just decamp there for a few weeks and just work down there in the morning and evening and then get some sun in the afternoon. And it's just a nicer place to work out of for a while. So well, we'll do that. You deserve it. And uh, I can't wait to have you back on the show again. Hang on because I have to wait for this to upload. So don't. Okay. End. Yeah. We understand that we use StreamYard as well. No worries. Yeah. It's uh, it works better, but it takes longer folks. If you like what's going on here, you know what to do. Uh, we all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go there, go to vinnytauteries.com, click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, gets my train down the track. Uh, so do all of that. By the way, I may open up the VIP group again in May. If you want to get in on that, uh, go to vinnytoyers.com slash VIP. Put your information in so that when we open it up, you could be, everyone wants to get into that group. And I try to keep it exclusive. If you want to get in the next time I open it up, you have to give me your email address so we can write to you. Blah, 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 blah. Okay rate and review this podcast. You know the rest. On behalf of Zoe Harcombe, my name is Vinnie Tartarich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>